Modifying a 5 inch gauge Great Western Railway 14XX steam locomotive part 20 The post-mortem after the steam test So what went wrong? Well not a lot really, it seemed to run quite well Apart from really bad priming You would expect priming where the water is lifted with the steam in a new boiler But not as bad as in the last episode So what's the problem? Well I knew all along But I didn't let on during the episode the purpose of a dome on a steam locomotive is to put a high point on the boiler where the steam is collected. So what I'm doing here is taking off the inner part of the dome to have a look inside it. Well at least there is a collector pipe in the dome but it's not attached to anything. It has about one and a half threads on it and these one and a half threads are what holds this pipe in place on the main regulator tube and obviously not well enough. It beggars belief how such a quality piece of engineering can be put together so badly when most of the parts are very well made indeed. I just don't understand it. So this is not much of a job but it should have been done properly in the factory in China and instead it's been done in my home workshop in Darkest Dewsbury in West Yorkshire, United Kingdom. But at least it will work when I finish with it. I'm currently re-threading the cross tube and the cross tube is the main tube that holds the regulator and feeds the cylinders, and I'm re-threading it 5 sixteenths of an inch by 40 threads per inch, and I've re-threaded the end of this tube using my tailstock die holder in the lathe, and this is also threaded 5 sixteenths by 40 threads per inch. So why use 40 threads per inch, why not 32? 40 threads per inch is a fine thread, and when it's fitted into the main regulator tube using retainer, it's going nowhere. I found a large screwdriver to fit in the original slot across the top of the tube and screwed it in place very firmly. Please note I used high strength retainer for the tube but when it comes to fitting the brass part which is called the inner dome I'm using Loctite 542. Loctite 542 is just a hydraulic thread sealant. It's not designed to permanently hold the part in place. So with the combination of Loctite 542 and a nice big copper washer and the part being securely tightened in place should ensure that it doesn't leak. That's the inner dome sorted out. Now the outer dome is a real problem. It leans a little bit, so I'm going to have to fix this. So the first thing I did was re-threaded the hole in the top of the dome. This hole, by the way, doesn't go all the way through into the water space. It's just a blind hole, so I'm being very careful not to snap the tap off. The original small bolt that held this dome in place was minute. It was about 10 BA, or a metric equivalent of about 1 mm probably. Far too weak. I drilled the hole in the dome out to 1 8 of an inch to take a 5 BA stud. And I plugged up the original hole that I re-threaded with a brass bolt, and then holding the dome in the correct position, I could then drill the hole in the correct place in the inner dome after which I threaded the whole 5BA to accept the stud and a washer and a nice brass nut on the top. From the top of the engine to the bottom of the engine. Now this thing is supposed to be a drain cock and just look at it, it's wobbling about and it doesn't do anything. I would describe this as a piece of engineering excrement. Believe it or not it's actually quite well made but it doesn't work, the hole's too small in the middle, it's not in the right position. So the only thing to do about this is first of all discard this pin that goes through with the circlip. I'm not having any circlips on this engine at all. The first thing I had to do was straighten out the pipe and then very carefully unscrew the tap. So let's have a closer look at this piece of engineering excrement. But before I look at the part in detail I'm just going to get rid of the washer and this horrible sealant that's all over the engine. Right so here's the drain cock. Now the idea of a steam locomotive is that it has drain cocks on the end of each cylinder to prevent the cylinders from hydraulic locking. But because of the design of this engine, it doesn't work like that. There's one drain cock in the steam chest, and this tiny little drain cock with a hole through the middle that I can hardly see without a magnifying glass. Oh yeah, and the hole's blocked, I mean, it doesn't do anything, there's a lump of swarf in the middle of the hole. The fix is simple, I unsilver soldered the thin capillary pipe from the end of it, then I cross drilled the moving part 3 seconds of an inch and I also re-drilled the body of the valve a bit bigger too. Then I put the valve back together including the two o-rings that make it watertight and now when I push the rod in the cab the drain cock opens. Look, quite simple. 
It didn't do this before, it was completely ineffective. So if I can do it in my small home workshop in Dewsbury, I fail to see why it cannot be done at the factory in China. The last part of the job was to replace the original pin and circlip with a nut and bolt. And before I get any comments, the bolt has a parallel shank and a thread at the end. Over now to the superstructure. This is the whistle valve and to get this out I had to remove four very tiny bolts to get the bracket off the main superstructure. Then I could remove the whistle valve. I'm not going to use this. Time now to see if the superstructure fits on top of all the new parts that I've fitted to the engine and the bad news is no it doesn't. It nearly does but the pressure gauge is in the way. The extension piece that I made that fits into the turret and holds the pressure gauge siphon is too long. It just won't fit. So the obvious thing to do was to shorten it. But no matter how short I made this extension, it was still too long. So much as I didn't want to do this, I had to trim the metalwork on the superstructure. And I used a cutting disc for this and finished it off with a drum sander. And now it looks like this. It's not a very good camera angle. This is quite smoothly cut. So now the superstructure fits on the chassis, which is always a good thing. The locomotive looked pretty much like this when I first bought it, but now it really is fairly completely different at the cab end. This is the injector fitting that I made for the feed water, because originally it was just onto a very small union, which tended to restrict the flow of the water, but this one will be okay. I need to touch in some of the paintwork, but one or two very minor marks on the paintwork. The problem is, I can't find the right colour. Phoenix Precision Paints says this is GWR Loco Green from 1926 to 1945, but when I paint it on the engine, it's not the same colour, it's a bit darker. And this other tin of paint, and here's an example of it, is Great Northern Railway Green, which is a good bit brighter. So by carefully mixing these two colours together, I can arrive at the colour of this engine. Can you spot it? No, I can't either. So just for the record, Great Western Green and Great Northern Green mixed together give you this colour, which is Great Western Railway Green with a hint of Great Northern Railway in it. And what a combination that would have been. Just look at the accuracy of this cab assembly. It's absolutely beautiful. So that's it. I'm just going to give it a coal-fired steam test. Then I think I'll give it a bit of a run on a track and see how it performs. So all being well, the next video in this series will be the coal-fired steam test. And unless something really bad goes wrong with the engine, that will be part 21, the final episode. So I look forward to that, but that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.